And so this is the study that we, it was done with a, with a colleague, uh, Katja Weimer, Weimer Hastings, where we attempted to, to test these ideas. Um, and what we did was we simply gave people um, uh, three abstract concepts and three concrete concepts and has, asked them to list features that are typically true of each of these. And um, then we coded the features that they produced into whether they described um, entities, settings, and events, or mental states. And these are the general categories we use. The, the paper actually describes a much more detailed coding scheme, but this is all, all I'm going to tell you about now. And the first thing to note is that basically we found situate, broadly situated content for both kinds of concepts. So both kinds of concepts, people describe entities, settings, and events, and mental states. So this, people are describing situations when you ask them what's in a concept. But the other thing that's going on here is that each of these vertical pairwise differences is, is, is statistically significant. Um, so people produce more entity information for the concrete concepts, but they produce more setting and event and mental state information for the abstract concepts. So this is kind of consistent with that proposal I made a moment ago in that they're, both kinds of situations are grounded in situations, but they're picking out different information in these situations. Sorry. Yes. Uh, point of clarification, could you give an example of what you were specifically asking people as subjects to do? So you said, what's a hammer and when would you use it? Or what is a hammer? What's the truth? It would be something like, um, what, what features typically would be present when you experience truth? Or when you experience a sofa? Or, or, or what, I, I don't remember the exact <coughs> language we use, but it's just very simple, one sentence. You know, what, what kinds of... What are the characteristics or the, the kind of information that would be relevant to each of these? So it's a very open-ended question. This is, and, and there are now two other papers that have kind of replicated the same thing, and everybody finds exactly the same, same general pattern. Um, it, it's, it's hard, especially for the abstract concepts, it's very hard to get this information out. And, I'm, and um, we could talk about this later, but I think the information you get is maybe somewhat problematic. But, uh, but, I, but I think... I think that these distributions are correct. Um, but how you measure these concepts, again, it goes back to this, we don't know very much about the content of these concepts or how to measure them. The other thing that isn't shown here, it's, it's in the papers, we measured the complexity of the representations and their hierarchical depth, their, and also the relational complexity, and the abstract concepts are higher on all of those measures than the concrete. They're more complex, they're more relational, they're deeper hierarchically, so it's... It fits with this idea that they're, they're more complex kinds of structures than the concrete uh, concepts. And I probably, if I forget to mention this, well, I'll show you some brain imaging data in a while, but abstract concepts activate much more of the brain than the concrete concepts do, which is consistent with this as well. Okay, so those are the kind of the introductory things that I wanted to talk about. Now I want to focus primarily on the representation of abstract concepts. And I'm going to talk about the roles of language, the roles of simulation, and then kind of the, co the integration of these two in, in representing and processing uh, abstract concepts. Um, now, in terms of um, the empirical evidence that's out there that bears on um, kind of how abstract concepts are represented, the overwhelming message in both the behavioral and the, and the neuroscience literatures is that abstract concepts are represented with language. So as you may recall, Pavio argued that the primary, that what distinguishes abstract concepts from concrete concepts is that abstract concepts only have a linguistic code, not an imagistic code, whereas concrete concepts have both. Um, and there's a, quite a bit of empirical literature, which is, I would say, consistent with that. And that in the neuroimaging literature, what people have done is simply present people with concrete and abstract concepts, again, in lists, um, and with various kinds of tasks, lexical decision, usually pretty superficial linguistic tasks. I'll be talking more about this later. Um, but generally, what happens is, is that when you look at the areas that are more active for the abstract concepts, they tend to be in left hemisphere language areas, Broca's area, and uh, left hemisphere temporal areas, as, as you can see in this um, study, recent study from Binger's lab. Now, there are some limitations of, of this work, especially um, the neuroimaging work, that I think are important to bear in mind when drawing conclusions about the role of language in representing abstract concepts, because pretty much what people want to conclude is that's, that's what's going on with these concepts. That's how they're represented. One thing to note is that the tasks that people are, have used are relatively shallow tasks, like lexical decision, synonym judgments, recognition memory, and so forth. 
So it's not like people are doing kind of deep conceptual processing of these concepts, kind of in the way that I started talking about, like, par like in, the, in the law case, in paradigms of human activity. Another thing about these tasks is that they're um, highly language oriented. You're simply presenting people with isolated words or kind of no pictures, no other sense of um, generating ex other kinds of experien more experiential representation. So that might be a factor in the results that people have seen. A third factor is that, um, it is that the literature largely hasn't taken into account Schwanenflugel's uh, kinds of proposals and findings, which are that these concepts seem to depend critically on situations. They, they, they behave very differently when they're not placed in a situation as opposed to when they're placed in a situation. And by and large, they haven't been studied when placed in situations. So, you know, we, all the results that, that largely exist have been found while they've, while they've been studied in isolation. So the question becomes, what kinds of representations might become active for abstract concepts when they're subjected to deep processing in more image-based or experience-based kinds of settings at, that are, that are, are situated in, in the way that Schwanenflugel talked about? And basically, kind of coming from my perspective, what, what my students and colleagues and I have, have increasingly come to believe is that under kind of deep experience oriented, situated task conditions, we're going to see um, simulation being um, central to the representation of abstract concepts. And in particular, simulations of background situations, like setting where something's taking place, um, and all sorts of uh, the other things that I talked about earlier in the, in the, the Weimar-Hastings paper about uh, kind of the, you know, what seems to be important for abstract concepts of various kinds of mental states, complex events, the relations between them. And so kind of our prediction was that if we study abstract concepts under these different conditions, this, is, this might be what we see as constituting a representation rather than just kind of some kind of linguistic representation. So I'm going to go off in just a little sidetrack here and talk about um, simulation for a while, some problems with simulation as it relates to um, abstract concepts. And then I'll come back in 10 minutes or so and bring the implications of this tangent to bear on, on abstract concepts again. So this slide summarizes the basic idea behind simulation. The idea is imagine that you're looking at this thing here, this instance of a category, and that what it does is, and let's say you're interacting with it, you know, it, it, so you're, you're, it, this is producing visual activation, auditory activation, let's say the thing barks, you pet it, use your motor system, you touch it, um, you, you have some kind of sensory experience. And so as you're inter interacting with this object, all, all of the relevant brain areas are becoming active. And the idea is that then there are association areas that capture the state of activation that the brain is in while it's interacting with um, this entity so that um, that state of the brain can later be simulated or reenacted for representational use. This is kind of the idea behind kind of the, the grounded or embodied approach to the conceptual system. So this slide illustrates kind of the simulation aspect. So once you've, you've captured the state of the brain while experiencing dogs, the idea is that on later occasions, when you hear the word dog, the way you represent what a dog is, is you reenact these states that occur when you actually experience dogs. Um, so you, you kind of simulate the experience of a dog. Now, the argument isn't at all that you kind of completely reinstate any one of these experiences or that, you know, or that it's vivid or accurate. There are all sorts of ways that these simulations can vary from the original experiences. Uh, we assume that they, can, that they probably occur unconsciously more than they occur consciously. Um, so uh, there, are all, uh, there are all sorts of forms that we think these things take that um, I'm not going to say much about. Um, here's some, and there's just a ton of evidence, both behavioral and, and neural now, for this view. Um, here's, some example, uh, here's some examples from a recent study uh, that was performed in my lab with a former post, two former postdocs, Andy James, Kyle Simmons, former graduate student, um, uh, Aaron uh, Barbe, and then the head of our imaging center, uh, Xiaoping Hu. And um, in this experiment, we simply presented people with words. It's actually more, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to give you a limited description of the experiment just to keep things simple. But all you need to know is we presented people with words. They, they judged how familiar they were, the meaning was for them. And uh, what we found was that when we gave people motion words, we found that areas 
associated with visual motion in the vicinity of areas associated with visual motion become active. Um, whereas when we gave people words for um, places in the world, we found perihippocampal areas active. Uh, areas sim similarly become active when you actually experience a, a, a situation and you have to categorize it. So the kind of the point is, and what, what, the, what these results show and the many others, is that when you are activating conceptual information from words, that you're reactivating the parts of the brain that would be active if you were actually experiencing uh, a category instance. And as I said, there's a lot of evidence now for this view uh, across multiple disciplines, and not only in conceptual processing, but um, uh, from processes ranging from perception to social cognition. Now, um, there, is, uh, uh, there are a variety of problems for this view that have been raised, and um, I want to just focus on one here because it's going to be relevant for the story that I want to talk about, abstract concepts. Um, and this is a study from a, a good friend of mine, Stephen Coslin, classic study, where, you know, and, and as you probably know, Coslin has argued for the importance of imagery and working memory for decades, and, and um, this was one of the studies that, uh, early studies that he used to argue for this position. It's a property verification task where you give people a word for an object like cat and then a property like clause, and they have to say whether or not this is a true or a false property. So sometimes the property is true, sometimes it's false. And the great thing that Coslin did in this experiment was he manipulated the size of the property. So some of the properties were small and some of them were large. And what he found was that when he asked people to perform this task using imagery, so imagine um, the, you know, the cat, and then when you get the property, imagine the, pr uh, when you get the property, imagine the property, and if the property is a part of the object, say true. What he found was that when participants were given imagery instructions like these, that the size of the property um, had an effect on reaction time. And, the and because people were sensitive to the size of the property, he argued that they had a visual, they were processing a visual information, a visual representation of the cat and of its, of its properties in working memory. But the other thing that he found in this experiment, which is a problem for the view that I just described, is that when he didn't give people um, imagery instructions, they, they just were given these pairs and had to veri perform verification, there was no size effect. It disappeared. So he argued that, only, that basically long-term memory contains amodal representations of concepts, the standard view, and that you only get these size effects in, because you're able to construct you know, imagery-based representations of working memory. But again, what we want to argue is that you store these things in long-term memory as well, and when you pull up information about categories from long-term memory, it's in these image-based forms. So this has been something we, we started worrying about uh, back in the early 90s, and we basically, for reasons, well, that will become clear in a second, we came up with an alternative explanation of his findings, which isn't that imagery only exists in working memory, not in long-term memory. What we argued was that people are doing deep processing in this condition, but shallow processing in this condition. And when they do shallow processing, it tends to only deal with linguistic forms. And so I'm going to go through some research that we did to follow up on this uh, to kind of illustrate this distinction. And then I'm going to come back to abstract concepts because I think this distinction is very important for abstract concepts. So basically, um, the way that this um, our framework goes that, that I'm going to be talking about in a moment is that when you receive a word, the first thing that happens is you retrieve other linguistic forms that are associated with it, just other words that are associated. And, and then more slowly you start retrieving simulation information of the type that I talked about a moment ago. And depending on a variety of factors, you'll use one or the other type of information in making a, a decision about um, uh, on the task that you're currently performing.